The Tom Woods Show, episode 1489. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, one of the most demoralizing things is when someone utters the truth and then lamely apologizes. Well, not these folks. I've got a free ebook of stories from heroic professors who told the PC mob to go pound sand. Stories from Jordan Peterson, Michael Rechtenwald, and others. Check it out at againstthemob.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. By myself today, I've got a topic I want to review with you folks. But before I get to that, I want to tell you about tomorrow. If you're listening to these episodes as they come out, tomorrow is September 11th, 2019. And joining me to talk about September 11th, 2001 will be Scott Horton. So that will be memorable, and you won't want to miss that one, of course. But today I thought I would take a few minutes to look back on a now-deceased website that had much to say about your host here over the years and much to say about Guest number one, the very first guest ever on The Tom Woods Show, guest for episode number one, Michael Bolden, founder and executive director of the 10th Amendment Center. Uh, Think Progress was recently uh, shuttered. The site is up. If you go to thinkprogress.org, it's still up. But if you click on any of the headlines, you'll find that they're all at least several days old. They haven't been updated. They're not going to be updated because that's the end of it. They tried to find a buyer and were unsuccessful. So Think Progress has expired. Think Progress was what I call a thought control website. So if you said something outside the three by five card of allowable opinion, they would go after you for it. They wouldn't generally try to refute you because that's not the point of a thought control site. The point is to alert everybody that you've had an unapproved thought and to scold you for that, not to show where you're wrong. And that happened to me over and over and over again. Oh, look at Woods. He's got these crazy extreme ideas. They never refuted me, or or they allegedly refuted me with the dumbest arguments that I'd been over so many times, I even made an FAQ saying, look, if you have anything to say against me, make sure it's not these seven things, because I've already answered them, and you haven't responded to my answers. So anyway, it was with some, I have to say, childish, juvenile delight that I got the news that Think Progress was no more. Now, they... I was going to have Michael Bolden on to talk about this with me, but he's dealing with some flooding in his apartment that he's just getting over, and I I don't want to make him crazy. So what I want to do in particular is focus on one person, and this guy apparently now is working for Vox, so he just won't go away. And it's their, quote, justice editor (sighs) named Ian Milheiser. Oh, my gosh, Ian Milheiser. One of my favorite things from Ian Milheiser is something I mentioned the other day in my email newsletter. Now, my email newsletter is something I keep urging people to be receiving. Of course, if you listen to this show and you're not getting the newsletter, I don't know what to tell you, but it's darn good, okay? And my most recent free ebook that I'm now giving away when you sign up for the newsletter is AOC is Wrong. So you really need to read that because that's really darn good. That I know that we all think, oh, her arguments are so dumb. But yeah, but if you came across the average person for whom some of her arguments do sound plausible, that, hey, if we want outcome X, then why don't we legally mandate outcome X? It just seems natural to a lot of people. Do you really think you have the absolute crushing response? Maybe not. So you want to get AOC is wrong. It doesn't cost you anything. Get it at aocswrong.com. You got to admit, that's a pretty darn good domain name. aocswrong.com. Pick that up there and you'll automatically be getting my email newsletter, my libertarian newsletter, that is. I have two of them. One of them is the libertarian one, and you'll enjoy it. So on that, in that newsletter, when I broke the news about the demise of Think Progress, I pointed out one of my favorite Ian Milheiser anecdotes. And in a minute, I'll get to something more substantial about poor Ian. But this one, on Twitter, he was unhappy that And normally I don't care about stuff like this. Who gets appointed to be ambassador of where? It couldn't be less interesting to me, except in this case when it involves Ian Milheiser. He was unhappy that Terry Branstad, who at the time was the governor of Iowa, had been chosen to be the new ambassador to China. So that, of course, is just an outrage because everybody knows that you must be a backwards hick 
You must be a backward hick if you live in Iowa. If you're a white guy in Iowa, we all know that you must be a stupid idiot. So on Twitter, he said, I'm sure the governor of a small, rural, landlocked state full of white people will totally know a whole lot about China, comma, and stuff. Okay, first of all, first indication that he's a terrible writer is the and stuff, because that's supposed to be funny. That's actually not funny. That's extremely irritating. So that that is the sign of a bad writer, because he honestly thinks that's kind of cool and funny. That is not. It's not. So anyway, he had to withdraw that tweet because people who actually knew something, who actually bothered to learn something before opening their mouths, pointed out that Branstad had tremendous experience in trade dealings with China and that the Chinese foreign minister had greeted the choice of Branstad with kind words for what he called, quote, an old friend of the Chinese people, unquote. So the embarrassment became too much, so Ian withdrew the tweet. Now notice, he didn't withdraw the tweet because he was ashamed of his remark about a, quote, state full of white people. You know, that was the sort of thing a normal person would feel funny about saying, not Ian. He withdrew the tweet simply out of embarrassment because everybody was bludgeoning him over the head about the fact that Branstad knew a lot about China and had a lot of experience with China. But that's the way Ian speaks, because obviously for him, like for, as for a lot of progressives, white people just means ignorant and stupid. And if white people object to that characterization, why, they must be white supremacists, which, as you know, is the left's new favorite shutdown discussion term. Well, there ain't no think progress no more. Uh, but, you know, we'll carry on, because we're going to hear from Ian, no doubt, from wherever he winds up. I mean, he's at Fox now, and... When they run into trouble, he'll wind up someplace else. But what I want to do is recall in particular his treatment of a topic that is very important to me because I wrote a book about it. I did a lot of public speaking about it. I'm absolutely convinced that I'm right historically, strategically, morally, constitutionally, and in any other way. And that is state nullification of unconstitutional federal laws. If you've followed me for any length of time, you know that I've written a book called Nullification which I think is extremely convincing. The audiobook version you can get at tomwoodsaudio.com. That's the Audible. If you've never joined Audible before, you can go to tomwoodsaudio.com. You can get that book for free on audiobook. And if you decide you don't want to stay with Audible, you just quit within, I guess, 30 days or something like that, and you can keep your free book. So, you know, why not do it? So tomwoodsaudio.com. And what I want to do at the beginning here is... I just want to read a portion of a column I wrote about Ian Milheiser, and then I'll go back to just talking to you folks. But I looked this over this morning, and I thought, I just can't improve on this. You know, years and years later, this is exactly what I would say even today. So here's, here's what I have to say. Now, but now by the way, by the way, the, the key thing for Ian here is that nullification is not an idea that the New York Times has approved. So it's incredibly uppity for me to be proposing it. How dare I? Don't I know my place? My place is to sit here like a good loser and be told what to think by the New York Times. That's what I'm supposed to do. So he is shocked that I won't do it. Secondly, the key thing for him is nationalism. Okay, I'm sure he thinks he's an anti-nationalist because he doesn't like Trump. He's just as bit of a nationalist as Trump because he wants centralized decision-making and he does not want there to be localized resistance. So therefore, he's a nationalist. He's a left nationalist, like all his progressive friends. Uh, there are very, very few people on the left who are not in some way nationalists these days. Very, very few. They all favor the concentration of power at the center and the subordination of the constituent parts of the union. That They all favor that. That's what nationalism is. The, the flag waving and the patriotic songs are merely incidental. This is what nationalism is is prioritizing the nation over any of the building blocks of the nation or anything lesser than, smaller than the nation. That's nationalism. And for that, yeah, Ian Milheiser is completely on board. So it doesn't matter to him that with nullification, we were half the time basically promoting causes that have been associated with the left. For example, against the drug war, but not just that. To him, much, much more important than that is that nationalism and centralization be maintained. Which is why, by the way, when the Gonzalez versus Raich case was heard, which is the, the Angel Raich case was the medical marijuana case, when that came before the Supreme Court, it was the left liberals, by and large, who 
came down against Angel Rage. It was Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer uh, because you would think, oh, wouldn't they, these people are liberals and they care about individuals and they, you know, whatever, right? They care about the rights to civil liberties and the right to use drugs and whatever. No, no, they don't. That, that no, no, that is not at all what they're about. They're about nationalism. And they realized that if we let California get away with this, if we let them have a marijuana law at odds with federal law, this is going to undermine the federal monopoly on governing on every topic under the sun. Even though governing on every topic under the sun is not what they're allowed to do under the Constitution. But that doesn't matter to these people. So nationalism is what matters, not the suffering of that woman. Oh, liberals care about human suffering. No, they don't. They care about nationalism. Everything else is secondary and incidental. And it was proven by the left-wing judge's decision in the Angel Rage case. Here was a suffering woman they easily could have helped, and they didn't because they want nationalism. They want centralization of power. So anyway, let me read this little bit to you from Ian about uh, – a column I wrote about Ian Milheiser. goes as follows. To be attacked by a Gore Vidal or an H.L. Mencken, one of the great wordsmiths of American criticism – while surely unpleasant, must have been oddly exhilarating for the poor souls on the receiving end. I, on the other hand, have the more dubious and prosaic distinction of being a regular target of Ian Milheiser. So you've never heard of Ian Milheiser. You've never seen him, but you only think you haven't. You have. Ever met someone who's dying to let you and the rest of the world know he holds all the approved opinions? Then you have met Ian Milheiser. In every hysterical reaction to dissident voices, i.e. voices that gasp, differ from both Barack Obama and Mitt Romney, you have seen him. You have seen Ian in every social climber who would die a thousand deaths before entertaining an unconventional thought. In literature and television, we have the stock character, the absent-minded professor, the stuck-up cheerleader, the backwoods yokel. Milheiser, too, is a stock character. He is the thought controller, impatient with diversity, predictable, establishment, banal, humorless. Milheiser typically insinuates that people who disagree with him strongly, like me, are probably indifferent to or even privately supportive of slavery. Slavery! But consider this. Abolitionist political parties were lucky to receive 2% of the vote. How likely is it that someone desperate to hold approved, establishment-friendly opinions, like Ian, would have been, of all things, an abolitionist? Ian has no scholarly accomplishments I can uncover, no peer-reviewed articles, no books from major scholarly publishers, indeed no books from any publisher at all. That in itself doesn't make Ian a bad fellow, of course. But it's kind of funny that the entire Milheiser corpus of panicked articles about the takeover of the United States by unlettered rubes is composed by someone of no scholarly distinction whatever. Once or twice a year, I reply to another one of Ian's pieces. They're all pretty much the same. Uncomprehending analysis, stern rebukes of dissidents, and stolid sledgehammer prose without elegance or nuance. He is a self-parody, the epitome of the hectoring PC automaton. Milheiser pretends my replies to him do not exist. He continues to make the same inane arguments in the full confidence, alas, probably justified, that his limited audience has not read my refutations. In fact, he refuses to quote anything I have written in the past 15 years. That's about what one can expect from Think Progress and the other left-wing thought control sites that monitor and censure unapproved thoughts. My nullification FAQ, which, by the way, you can reach at nullificationfaq.com, was largely inspired by Milheiser, who raises the same long-exploded arguments again and again, no matter how many times I refute them. I finally decided to write up an FAQ and leave it at that. You will not be surprised to learn that Milheiser pretends the FAQ does not exist. I've written a whole book about nullification of unconstitutional federal laws. Milheiser has attacked and smeared me for years without once quoting from that book or from anything I have written on the topic. 
In my book, I included many primary documents, in part so readers wouldn't have to take my word for things, and in part to make it harder for the world's Milheisers to erase them from history. Now, I won't read the second half of the column because the second half is my critique of an interview he did, and it would just be too tricky to to read that. But let me leave you with this final paragraph and a half. His latest is an interview at Alternet with editor Joshua Holland called American right-wingers are no longer conservative, they're extremists. Ooh, well, we can't have that. Extremist is one of the commissar's favorite words. Nothing gets under the thought controller's skin more than an uppity peon who thinks there might be more to political philosophy than John Kerry and Mitch McConnell. Be satisfied with the range of debate we allow you, citizen. Any opinion a reasonable person might want to hold can be found in that yawning chasm that separates these two men. You have an opinion that differs from both of them, you say? Why, you're an extremist. Okay, I've got some fun here that I want to engage in in just a minute. But first, let me make an appeal to you good folks. And the appeal is this. You've heard me say, I want you to try something that maybe you've never tried before. Maybe there are folks who listen to The Tom Woods Show who meditate regularly, but I bet a lot of you don't. And I bet a lot of you don't because you think, I don't have the time and I'm not really sure it's going to do anything for me. Well, to my amazement, some of my listeners have actually written to me specifically to thank me for promoting the Simple Habit app. Simple Habit offers short meditations that can be consumed in five minutes. You can consume them while you're walking down the street, washing the dishes, whatever. And these are meditations that are designed to help you with specific problems in your life. And I have people telling me that their mental health and their stress levels are much improved as a result of using it. Now, I already knew it was good because I've started to use it myself. The fact that you folks listening to me have gone and done it and come back and said, this stuff works makes me all the more confident in it. You get hundreds of meditations for free and thousands with the premium subscription. Well, if you go to simplehabit.com slash woods, you can take 30% off that premium subscription. That's 30% off the premium subscription to the Simple Habit app when you go to simplehabit.com slash woods. All right, let me read a little bit of, of something that Milheiser once said. Reactionaries have recently floated this idea that the states can just nullify any federal law that they don't like based on the 10th Amendment. Um, wasn't that something that we settled with the Civil War? Okay, that's the depth of his analysis. And I love the um. Don't you love the um? Again, he thinks that's clever. If I say um, this will make my opponent seem even stupider. Like, um, don't they realize it's like 2013 now, which it was at the time he said this. Um, don't these people like realize it's like 2013 and we don't have these ideas anymore because the Civil War already took care of them? Like, didn't they read? Like, didn't their teacher tell them this? You know, it's that kind of tone, right? It's almost like a valley girl kind of tone that – He's going to look down on us like that because, you know, these people, they're just, they're like repeating things that, you know, we already like talked about and we're all done with that now. And all right. First of all, it's extremely immoral to say that anything that we settled that with the Civil War, like we settled an intellectual dispute because nullification is just an intellectual dispute. Is the compact theory of the union correct or is the nationalist theory of the union correct? And he's basically saying, well, the nationalist theory is correct because we decided that with the Civil War. So you're saying violence settles the dispute about which theory of the union is correct? What? Bob Murphy put it this way. He said, that would be like saying the Plains Indians. What? Didn't the U.S. Army settle that issue? What? What kind of bizarre pro-violence response is this? Or – your kid gets beaten up on the playground and you say, well, I guess that settled that. You'd say that to your kid? Well, you know, I guess we were testing to see if you were, you know, a good guy or not. And I guess, well, I guess we settled that one. By violence? Oh, my mother taught me that you don't settle disputes through violence. Not, not Ian's, apparently. And incidentally, of course, nullification is not about nullifying any federal law a state doesn't like. Although not that I have any objection to that idea. That would certainly be better than what we have now. But it is based on the idea that if a law is unconstitutional, the states, having been the creators of the federal government, need to be the last bulwark of resistance. This is what James Madison said in his report of 1800, that 
all three branches of the federal government have a responsibility to uphold the Constitution. But if all three of them, including our judges, fail us, then it falls to the constituent parts of the union, namely the states, to protect us. That was said there. Jefferson could not have been clearer about this. Milheiser, I don't think, ever, ever in his career mentioned Jefferson in connection with nullification. He doesn't dare. None of them dare. Because if Jefferson supported it, how non-mainstream can it be? I mean, Jefferson, you know, is the principal drafter of the Declaration of Freaking Independence, for heaven's sake. If it turns out that the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798 were drafted by Jefferson, which is the best statement you can ever read about the compact theory of the Union and nullification, there it all is laid out, not to mention the follow-up resolutions of 1799, well, that makes it trickier for them. So therefore, you leave him out. You mention John C. Calhoun instead, because everybody's been taught to dislike him. So we mention him, but we leave out Jefferson. But as for the Civil War thing, Civil War was not fought over nullification. And in fact, in his farewell address to the Senate, Jefferson Davis denounced nullification. The, um, in South Carolina, the Declaration of Secession in December 1860 denounced northern nullification. The northern states employed and vindicated the principle more often than the southern ones did. As I show in my book, uh, repeatedly, they talked about and, and, and in fact, I, Daniel Webster said that in the War of 1812, if the federal government tries to engage in military conscription, then the state government should stop them from doing it. The state government should interpose between the federal government and their people to stop them from doing it. And there's a lot of good history here, and, and I refer you to my book, Nullification, on it. But Ian doesn't know any of it, okay? And, you know, in a way you don't blame him because in, in sixth grade or even 12th grade or even college, you really don't learn that history. You do not. And you certainly don't learn the compact theory of the Union. You don't read uh, Jefferson's views on it. You don't read John Taylor of Caroline. You don't read St. George Tucker. You don't read Abel Upshur. You don't read any of those people. Now, you also don't read John Marshall or Joseph Story either. <laughs> you, know, you really don't get any picture of it at all. But in law school, you might read some of that stuff. But you certainly don't read the compact theorists. And the compact theory of the Union, which I've talked about numerous times on the program – and I've got a whole chapter in nullification about it, really makes clear that nullification just follows naturally from that. But now I really do want to read a passage from an interview Ian did because I want you to see how incoherent this guy is uh, because he's got to uphold federal supremacy. But on the other hand, he knows the federal government does obnoxious things, which is something. I mean, for Ian, that's a real concession. So here's what he says. So there's one group of sheriffs that has said they will actively thwart the enforcement of federal law, and he's talking about on gun issues. So if the FBI agent shows up trying to enforce federal law, they will stand in that agent's way and try to prevent them from enforcing federal law, and that's unconstitutional. That's a form of nullification. There are other sheriffs who are saying they will not enforce the federal law themselves, but if the feds show up, they won't stop them. And that second thing is wrong because in many cases, these are good laws. And in the case of Colorado, where it's a Colorado state law, they probably have an obligation to enforce the state law. And I think it's a mistake if you tell your sheriffs that they're allowed to decide on their own which states they want to comply with. And now he says, now here's Milheiser again. But, you know, I think there's a broader principle, you know, with respect to these sheriffs who are just saying, you know, if the feds want to show up and enforce federal law, that's cool. We just won't help them. I don't agree with their decision, but I think that's less troubling, and I think that part of the reason why I take that position is that there's a similar battle going on right now over marijuana laws, where in states like Washington and Colorado, where marijuana is legal, I don't want to see state officials enforcing the federal marijuana laws. If the federal government wants to send DEA agents in there to enforce these laws, they have the right to do that. But, you know, at least as a constitutional matter, that is an area where the state and federal governments are separate. Oh my gosh, it must be exhausting to be this guy. So the sheriff shouldn't decide which laws they enforce, but they shouldn't enforce the marijuana laws because Ian Milheiser doesn't like those laws. So it's okay if they don't enforce those, but the federal government does have the right to come in and enforce their federal laws. And then that's okay because they have the right to do that. Even Oh my gosh. So in other words, he knows the laws are unjust and wrong. He, he won't admit they're unconstitutional, even though they clearly are. If they weren't, why did we bother having an amendment for prohibition? Why didn't they just pass a law? But they can go ahead and prohibit marijuana just like that? 
So why didn't they just pass a law at the time of prohibition? So he disagrees with the laws. He thinks they are outrageously unjust, no doubt. But his view is, well, you know, I guess you got to, you know, you got to let them do, you know, maybe the states could do a little bit. But if the federal government wants to come in and put people in cages, well, you know, federal supremacy is the most important thing. And oh, gosh, why would you want to be that guy? Why, why would you want to be that guy? Here's an obvious injustice, and I'm going to use a bogus constitutional justification to support the perpetuation of that injustice. I, I, you don't have to support the nationalist theory of the union. There's not a shred of evidence in its favor. Not a shred. Every single aspect of American history shows the states created the federal government. The states were the constituent parts. The peoples of the states are the reservoir of sovereignty, that there is no amalgamation of these sovereignties. There couldn't be such a thing. It's not how sovereignty works. That these bodies were clearly exercising the attributes of sovereignty even before independence. We see these things happening. The way the Constitution is written makes this clear. The union is referred to in the plural. The United States is referred to in the plural in the Constitution because it's a group of societies. The Declaration of Independence makes clear that the states are independent states States in the plural, not a single blob with an amalgamated sovereignty of some kind. Uh, this is made clear in, in the, the treaties that were entered into during the American Revolution uh, with other countries. They list every single state they're entering into this treaty with. They do not say the United States as a single blob. Uh, the evidence for this is overwhelming, not to mention the understanding of the law of nations at the time which was that when, when a state, a sovereign body, accedes to a federation like the United States, it does not forfeit its sovereignty in doing so. In joining, it is exercising its sovereignty. It does not forfeit that sovereignty. So the, the evidence is overwhelming. So he doesn't even have to twist himself into knots. He could just, seriously, I hate when people talk like this, but he could just pick up a book. He could learn something other than what he was spoon-fed in law school. All right, so the lesson here is go read my book, Nullification. And I very rarely say go read my book, but in this case, go read the darn thing, okay? Uh, it makes a really, really good case. I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 1489. Get the audiobook version for free at tomwoodsaudio.com. That's the best way you can dance on the grave of Think Progress, okay? We outlasted them. We outlasted them. The Tenth Amendment Center is still out there, up and running. Uh, Old Woods here is still pumping out podcast episodes. We're still here. Go look and see how strong this case is. Now, I know you may say, I'm a libertarian. I don't care about the Constitution. Okay, but a lot of Americans do. So if you can make the case on constitutional grounds, that can't hurt, right? But also, it's just good to know American history. I mean, if you're curious about American history, as I am, you're going to like the book Nullification. So go check that out. Uh, tomorrow, Scott Horton as I said, is coming on to talk about 9-11. Who better to do that than Scott Horton? So we talk about that tomorrow with Scott. I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.